it is like an explosion like uh, someone came above us explore a bomb something like that there are nothing left everything has gone everything has gone we are living i myself and my family are living on the ground just on the ground this is sadak hussein a rohingya man from the darpain village in situe myanmar he doesn't have a home anymore on may 14th the powerful cyclone moka unleashed its fury upon the port town of situe in the rakhine state the devastation was catastrophic particularly for the persecuted rohingya muslim minority even a week after the disaster the survivors are left with no shelter food or clean water to drink human rights activists say it's a silent genocide by the military junta this is beyond the headlines and i am anjana shankar this week we are looking at one of the most distressing stories of despair and survival coming out of myanmar in the aftermath of the cyclone moka before we start If you want to get all the latest episodes as soon as they come out then just hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcast. Thousands of flimsy Rohingya shelters were flattened or washed away. Families were left exposed and vulnerable. The cyclone ripped through the Bay of Bengal. across Bangladesh and Myanmar and made the landfall in Sitwe bridges roads and buildings crumbled under the cyclone's wrath aid agencies and victims have described the devastating aftermath of the cyclone Sitwe which is home to more than 130000 Rohingya Muslims bore the worst brunt of the cyclone that whipped up wind speeds of up to 209 km per hour and caused heavy flooding There was a power outage for days and telecommunication towers were destroyed. Communicating with survivors proved to be an immense challenge due to power outages and destroyed telecommunication networks. But Sadak managed to connect with me through a video call using Wi-Fi. He said he wanted to show me the extent of the damage in his village. The connection was wobbly, but I could get a glimpse of their desperate situation. Today I am standing here just to show you what is the situation after the cyclone Moka just recently hit it to the people who are in desperate situation at this moment now. So let me show you their house and their house was completely broken down now. That is the condition of their family as you can see here. Can you see that? Yes, we can we can see that. So there are only few houses standing as I as you take me through this yes exactly there are only in one village in in divine village there are only two or three village, uh, houses are standing there is new makeshift camp which is they have built by themselves Sadak can you tell me a little bit more about your family and what happened to them after the cyclone after the cyclone not only my family but also every single people who are in situ are become desperate situation and become destitute and also there were many people lose their life in the in the cyclone and i have lost one one of my cousin that uh, also have lost during the during the cyclone and it is really hard to explain how we should explain to you we are just uh, showing you only one village okay there are many many villages inside of sitwe who were hit it by cyclone moka it was a really heartbreaking scene that i saw as sadak walked through the village with his camera switched on there were people who had absolutely nothing not even a roof over their heads families including children huddled on the ground their homes reduced to rubble There were hardly a few houses left standing. He went inside a hut and showed me how they were cooking banana plants as they have nothing else to feed their five children. Sadak said many families including his are cooking dead cattle for food. Initially, the government restricted access to the affected areas, obscuring the true scale of the tragedy. The official death toll started at 7 
but later escalated when the government acknowledged over 100 Rohingya Muslim lives were lost. However, Sadak and his group of volunteers say they personally counted more than 400 bodies in the first two days alone. People are counting dead bodies of up to 400 plus. That's what you told me, that you personally counted so many dead bodies. Tell me, what is the real impact of Cyclone Mocha on the ground as you see it? As you can see here, now I am on the ground. That is the true information. I am standing here where Cyclone Mocha is. More than 400 people was dead in the Cyclone Mocha in only in Sitwe Arakan, okay? In Sitwe Arakan. So we are still counting. As I give it to you the list, on 50 of May 2023, we have found 410 dead body, and 60 of May 2023, we have found 83 dead body. So that is the number that we have found. That are most of the women, children, and elderly people. Most of the children. Tadak, how many children did you find? Maximum, that will be 200 children. The seriousness of the situation cannot be overstated. Cyclone Mocha ravaged the city of Sitwe, claiming the lives of over 400 people, predominantly women, children and the elderly. Although we couldn't independently verify the exact death toll, reports from aid agencies, local media and the visual evidence we obtained support Sadak's account. Myanmar does not recognize Rohingya Muslims as an ethnic group and categorizes them as illegal migrants from Bangladesh. They are denied citizenship and have no access to education or public health. In 2017, following a campaign of genocide by Myanmar's army, more than 700,000 Rohingya flee to neighboring Bangladesh. Evidence of mass murder, rape and violence was found, and the UN called it a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. The cyclone has made it even worse for the Rohingya that has been at the receiving end of violence and brutal crackdown since the military coup in 2021. If someone come and kill us, it will be better for us. Instead of seeing in this sort of situation, that's not I am saying, that's many people are saying. Many people are expecting that food will come tomorrow, food will come tomorrow, food will come tomorrow. But it's already seven days. It's already 10 days. Why? Why they are getting late to deliver the aid for us? We are also human beings. I know it was not easy for Sadak to do this. His own family of 10 members is in desperate state. Two of his relatives are still missing. But Sadak's plea echoes the desperation felt by countless others in his community. They are in dire need of immediate aid, yet the delivery of essential resources has been obstructed by the military junta. According to the UN aid agencies, including the UNHCR, the military junta has still not given them clearance to access the affected areas. So far, there has only been some limited relief efforts. Brad Haslett, Director of Partners, an international aid agency, told me his organization has been able to distribute food and shelter to thousands in the last two days. But that's few and far between, considering the dire situation. Even after such large-scale death and destruction, advocacy groups and human rights activists say the junta is blocking desperately needed humanitarian aid from reaching thousands of displaced Rohingya. Matthew Smith, founder and CEO of Fortify Rights, a human rights group say depriving aid to Rohingya is a form of genocide. This is sadly a scenario that we've seen play out many times in Myanmar, when, particularly with regard to the Rohingya. When the Rohingya people are in need of emergency aid, um, it has been common over the years for the authorities to basically deliberately obstruct the delivery of life-saving aid. This is part of the genocide that's been ongoing. It's worth mentioning, I think, though, that there are community-based groups, community-based aid workers uh, that have been working day and night in Rakhine State 
they do need support. The military for for quite some time has targeted in one way or another community based uh, aid workers in Rakhine State. Um, the military has murdered Rohingya aid workers over the years. It has imprisoned them over the years. The military has perpetrated this particular act of genocide in, in, in a number of ways. You know, this is a population of people who the military confines to very specific geographic areas and then denies them the right to livelihood, denies them the right to access health care, denies them the right to access food and other things they need to survive. And when you put those pieces together, a really sinister picture emerges. That's the gut-wrenching plight of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar who are trapped in a cycle of systemic abuse and neglect. As hundreds of thousands are left without shelter and food, the UN has made an urgent appeal to raise funds to support the most affected areas across Myanmar. Human Rights Watch has also demanded that the junta lift all blocks on life-saving aid delivery. This was Beyond the Headlines. Thank you for listening. Thanks this week to Sadak Hussain and Matthew Smith. This episode was produced by Doa Farid and Arda Edison, and I am Anjana Shankar. Just remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast app to get all the new episodes.